just join me in a quick prayer real quick. Uh, Lord, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to follow your will for my life. Thank you for giving me another chance to tell your story in my life. I'm continually amazed by your power and your mercy. Please guide my words to your glory. Thank you for places like Cornerstone and all churches, businesses, and buildings where at this very moment your people are gathered in your name. Remind us that your church is not a museum for good people, but a hospital for the broken. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, I am a very grateful believer in Jesus Christ. My name is John. Before I get going, I just want to give a very special thanks to, to Brent, uh, whose leadership in this program and personal encouragement and example to me have been impossible to measure in their value to me. I love you, brother. I really do. And there's a bunch of people in here, Basil, Griffin, and every one of you, even though I've only gotten to know some of you recently, uh, whether you're aware or not, each and every one of you play an intricate role in my walk every day. Thank you to all of you for being here, not just tonight, but every night. Just to tell you a little about me, I'm a millwright by trade. For those of you that don't know what that is, don't worry, I didn't know when the job was offered to me. <laughs> Quick explanation. I take big machines apart with big tools and put them back together with even bigger tools. Um, I'm 40 years old, I'm the father of a four-year-old boy, Graham, and a two-year-old little girl named Ansley. My wife, of when I wrote this, it was almost six years now, it's almost seven years. Uh, she is a nurse and is the most compassionate, caring, and in my experience is second only to Jesus when it comes to grace towards me. And I'm not just saying that because she's sitting right there. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure how many times I've stood in front of a group like this and bore my soul. Um, if this looks easy, believe me, it is not easy. Not for me. I'm scared. Even though I've done it before, I'm scared out of my mind. And this is where I really draw on the book of Joshua. In chapter 1, verse 6, 7, and 9, God says to Joshua, Be strong and courageous. Be strong and very courageous. This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And if Joshua can be courageous and take over for Moses, I can muster up a little courage and get through this. My father was career military and my mother worked at any odd job she could find in whatever city my dad was transferred to. I never wanted for food. The lights were never out. I always had clothes to wear. I wish that those things would have stood out more to me, but what stuck with me for a long time and still does, does to this day is that I never remember hearing my parents say, I love you, I'm proud of you, or God has something great in store for you. I would like to think that it did happen, but no matter how hard I try to remember, I cannot actually recall a single time that those words were directed at me. Could it be that my grandfather was a tyrant and my dad never learned how to express love because he himself never received it? Might it be that my mother and her family had to leave their home under the cover of darkness to escape her biological father's promise to burn down the house with all of them inside? Or could it be that my mother had to endure an endless parade of her mom's boyfriends, each one more abusive than the last? Is it possible that all of these and many other factors deprived my parents of the ability and or the desire to love me? Was it more a lack of skill than a purposeful omission? I can't be positive either way. What I can be positive of is the fact that not having heard those simple words, I never felt like I belonged, included, or that I was even wanted. I felt like a mistake, an accident, a burden. These feelings were only magnified by the seemingly systematic, verbal, emotional, and sometimes physical abuse out of the mouths and at the hands of the very people placed here to love me, protect me, and carry for me. Having said that, I would gladly accept every bruise, every teardrop, every hurt feeling, every sleepless night, 
in every what appeared to me at the time to be unanswered prayer if I could just go back and make my parents believe that nine-year-old, that ten-year-old, that eleven-year-old boy, that little boy that cried out to his parents for help and they rebuked him. When I told them what was happening to me at the hands of a family friend, not only did they dismiss my accusations as the overactive imagination of a little boy, but they returned me to the hands of the very man who was sexually abusing me. You see, the angry, hurtful words, the belt, and the hands of stone were nothing compared to the betrayal and the abandonment I felt in those lonely moments. They were supposed to protect me and love me, and they didn't either. To say that I did not handle this well and that it affected me adversely would be a dramatic understatement. Even at that young age, my view of right and wrong, boundaries, sex, love, and God were all but permanently set off kilter. Since I was young, I was unable to properly process all this, and feeling I had no one to talk to or trust, it set me down a very dark, very lonely road. As I entered my teens, I sought out anything and everything to attempt to make myself feel better, to feel accepted, to feel loved. Since most of the time that did not work, I tried to feel nothing at all. I tried everything, except God. I was so mad at God for the parents I had. I was so angry at God for allowing all these terrible things to happen to me while he sat idly by. In a mind clouded with pain, sadness, fear, and anger, I thought God was no better than my parents or the man who had victimized me. So being the genius that I was, I figured I would show God. I'll really mess up my life and that will teach God. That set me off on an almost 30-year journey of depravity, decadence, overindulgence, corruption, immorality, debauchery, etc., etc. I was a liar, a thief, a manipulator, a people user, a cheater, an alcohol and drug abuser. I was on a path to destruction with one destination in mind, and I was determined to run there as fast as I possibly could. I was running from my parents, I was running from an abuser, I was running from everything and everyone. I was running from a past that was right on my heels and quickly catching up to me. I was running from God just as fast as my little feet would take me. I was running from who I really was. I was in such a dark place and in so much pain. I wanted to end the pain and I was willing to try anything. Having been convinced that everyone, including God, did not care, I set out to find an end to the pain. So drugs and alcohol were a logical first step. I liked the way drugs made me feel for a little while. I forgot the pain, even if just for a little while. I used alcohol to excess. I drank in the morning, I drank at night, I drank at parties, I drank at school, I drank alone, I drank to pass out. Try as I may, even with drugs and large quantities of alcohol, I used to cover my problems. They were still there when I sobered up. They simply would not end the pain. My drug and alcohol use and the corresponding behaviors cost me jobs, too many friendships to count, and countless other relationships, and more than a few nights in jail. My attitude towards my life, along with my addictions, made it possible for me to steal a car and drive across the country, almost 1,300 miles from Tampa all the way to Port Huron, Michigan. I only realized where I was and what I had done when I approached the Canadian border. This little adventure cost me more than six months of my life. A positive for my stay there was that drugs and alcohol were removed as pervasive elements in my life. I never realized the hold they had on me until I could not have them anymore. They were removed, but my pain, my anger, and fear remained. As destructive and corrosive as the drugs and alcohol were, they were dwarfed by the destruction, perversion, and overall psychological and physiological effects my addictions to pornography and lust had on me. I simply exchanged one addiction for another. With these new addictions took hold of took hold, they took over. They literally invaded and destroyed every aspect of my life. On top of the physical and mental impact this had, 
the spiritual and emotional effects were much worse. It was worse because at least with drugs and alcohol I was rendered incapacitated to such a degree that I did not know or did not care that I was destroying my body along with my very soul. With the addictions to lust and pornography, I was all too aware of every single action I was taking. I knew exactly what I was doing. I knew it was wrong. I knew it was perverse. I knew I was behaving in a way that no man should. I, I knew, even though I had no relationship with God at all, I knew all this, and yet every time I lusted or looked at porn, I chose to do so. Every time I had sex based on lies and manipulation, I chose to do so, knowing I was doing the wrong thing. As bad as things were with drugs and alcohol, I had never known this kind of shame, this kind of guilt, this level of embarrassment. I had never had such a feeling of uncleanliness permeate each and every cell of my body to such a degree. I wanted to stop so badly, but the cycle of destruction had already taken hold, and I was so weak after years of addictions. The enemy had found a foothold. What started as a small crack in my spirit that allowed Satan to gain a foothold in me had turned into an absolute chasm, an abyss. I had completely turned my back on God. The enemy had free reign to plant whatever he wanted in my mind, and I seemed all too eager to follow along. This pattern of behavior went on for years with no end of sight. I was in complete darkness. Then I met a young lady who turned out to be my wife, along with an answer to a prayer I had not yet prayed. I would love to tell you that when I met her, that I had an aha moment and the heavens opened and everything was fixed and I was free of all my addictions and all my pain. It wasn't even close. What did happen was the beginning of her almost 12-year journey and struggle to convince me I was actually worth something to someone. I couldn't believe it. Even when we had kids, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it because all I had ever known was loneliness, anguish, and despair. They were my best friends. No matter what I could, no matter what, I could always count on them to keep me company. My addictions never let me down or abandoned me. They were always there when I needed them. The glaring problem was that my addictions were not as kind to those around me. Life with me meant a constant battle. Living with me meant living with someone who was always sneaking, always hiding. It meant dealing with lies and deception. For my wife, it meant being deprived of any and all honest affection and intimacy with the man she chose to marry. Through no fault of her own, she sacrificed many years of her life to a man who did not give as much to her as she gave to him. And you're probably saying to yourself what I said to myself. Why is he fighting her when she is finally giving him what he said he always wanted? Someone to say I love you and mean it. Someone to care for him and take care of him. I did want those things, but I wanted them 30 years ago from my mom and my dad. I wanted to hear it as that 9, 10, and 11-year-old boy. I wanted to hear I love you. I believe you. I'll protect you. I'll make sure nothing bad happens to you again. Around this time, my home life had disintegrated, and everything was coming to a head. My wife did not like me very much, and I didn't blame her. I was always angry, tired, and my only outward emotion was rage. If it didn't have an adverse effect on my kids yet, it would very soon. So my wife had a choice to make. In fact, her choice was already made. Get some help for my addictions and other issues, or my marriage was over. My short time as a father was probably over. I had a choice to make, but did not know where to go or what to do. Through a friend of the family, my wife heard of this thing called Celebrate Recovery. She said it was a church-based recovery program. I thought, great, two of my favorite things, God and public declaration of my problems. I figured I would go through the motions and that would be enough to keep the status quo. There was no way this was going to work for me. I felt like I was further away from God than anyone. I went to that first night and sat through what's called Big Group and thought to myself, I could sit through this for a few months, say a few creeds, sing a couple songs, easy, right? Then I'd be in the clear. Later that same night, I went into a small group, in this case, Newcomers 101, which is for first-timers to let them know what CR is all about. 
That night I sat in that chair of Newcomers 101 and listened to a man bare his soul. He ripped his own heart out and put it on display for total strangers. I was blown away. I was speechless. It amazed me that a man could be so vulnerable. I wanted to find out what made him be okay with that level of, 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 sorry, of openness. Well, I soon found out. He plainly but powerfully stated Jesus Christ brought him back from the edge of destruction. Jesus Christ shone a light on the darkness in his life. This is where my reluctance to accept God as loving was in full force. There was a battle raging in me. I left that meeting sure I would not return. But there was something that kept pulling at me the whole next week. I had no idea what it was, but I was drawn to go back. I cannot begin to even tell you how happy I am that I did. That week at Celebrate Recovery in big group after the lesson and during the final worship song, I finally realized what was pulling me to that place. It was Jesus Christ. It was Him and the Holy Spirit that pushed me to the back of the sanctuary where they had a few people to pray with you if you needed. And I definitely needed. I went back there and my life, this life and the next, were changed forever. In that moment in front of other broken people, I admitted my own brokenness. I asked Jesus to come into my life and come into my heart. I realized that all those years that I felt abandoned by God, I was wrong. I was interpreting my own numbness as his absence. This was new to me. It was a holy moment for me, something I never experienced before. Whenever my world touches God's world, even for a moment, that is a holy moment, and I live for those moments now. He was with me every time I got drunk or hot. He was the voice pleading with me to stop. When I didn't stop, he was the voice saying, let's get up and try again. He was there when my heart kept getting broken by my parents. He was there in those cold jails. I know that he was there with that 9, 10, 11 year old boy when he was scared and alone. He was there even as I was cursing his very name and doubting his sovereignty and his goodness. I am amazed at the magnitude of his love and the veracity of his pursuit. I pray every day that I never forget that. I would enjoy nothing more to say to you that as I said that prayer of the good confession and accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior, that instantaneously everything was fixed and all was well. That is not the case. Following Jesus is hard work. Rewarding, but it is work. It is a constant struggle against the world. The world wants me to fail. God is on my side, and he wants me to succeed and overcome. And I like my chances in that battle. It is a struggle. Anyone that says recovery is easy is fooling themselves or trying to fool you. I could never imagine how hard it was going to be. I was hoping just to say a few prayers and magically everything is better. That's not how it works. God required me to look deep into myself and tear away all the garbage. The proverbial peeling of the onion has brought me some great joy and brought many tears. When I realized I would have to forgive the man who molested me, when I realized I would have to forgive my parents, when I realized I would have to personally make amends for much of what I did, I'll be honest with you, I was scared to death. I was not looking forward to it. However, I was not and am not scared to walk this path because this is the path that God has chosen for me to walk. So I will continue to walk it with an open heart and mind. Plus, I know I will never be walking alone. I started this story as a broken man. I stand here still a broken man. The main difference is that Jesus is now putting me back together. For years, I tried to put myself back together. I would succeed for a little while but then fall apart again. The reason why is all I was trying to do was improve. Jesus does not improve. He perfects. Christ is putting me back together to complete his perfect plan for me. I know I don't deserve this. God has blessed me and continues to bless me daily, much more than I deserve or even dream of asking for. I ask God why he gives me so much so freely. Short answer, love. Long answer, he knows how I feel. Rejection, he felt it. Temptation, he knew it. Loneliness, he experienced it. Death, he tasted it. He knows how it feels to be lost and alone without anything or anyone. He is so moved by my need that he forgets his own. 
my relationship with Christ started barely a year and a half ago. In that time, I celebrate freedom from the shackles of addiction. I now have an amazing relationship with some amazing men, men that have a positive impact on my life. I have forgiven my parents. I have forgiven my abuser. In this time, my relationship with my wife is stronger and closer than I ever thought possible. This past year and a half has saved my marriage. It has saved my fatherhood. I celebrate 18 months of freedom. As Paul says in Galatians 5.1, we have freedom now because Christ has made us free. I think we get so caught up in who we think we are supposed to be that we forget that we should be living with the freedom Christ provides. I celebrate a lifetime full of grace. Some people I've talked to ask me, what is grace? I can only answer one way. Grace is a gift that we do not deserve, but he gives it anyway. I look at the wife I have and the kids I have, and when I think I get to be with her for a lifetime, and I think I get to be their dad for a lifetime, I shake my head and thank the God of grace for grace, and I just think it's amazing. As I wrap this up, my story is not unique, but I have grace. I am not special, but I have love. I am a sinner, but I have hope. My sins just may be different than yours. I still struggle. I don't win battles every day, but I have Christ. It turns out I wasn't that far from God. None of us are. We are all the same distance away. Just turn around, and He is right there. No matter what. That spiritual crack that turned into an abyss that I spoke of earlier is still there. But it is filled with the love, the grace, the spirit of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I will close with a few final thoughts. Please remember that God's grace is sufficient for you. It's sufficient for all of us. Please remember you are not alone no matter what your situation. Thank you for being a part of this journey with me. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share my story with you. Finally, I'll end with a little phrase my wife likes to say to our kids. And I believe Christ says to all of us, every minute of every day, I love you, and there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. Thank you.